that all to say, let's jump into the message this morning. Our, our theme verse has been out of Numbers chapter 9 and verse 22. It's a passage that involves uh, people that were perhaps on the longest road trip ever. It's Israel. They, they, they were on a 40-year road trip. And um, what I love about, about them, they did a lot of things right. But they did a lot of things wrong. But, but what I loved is that they were moved by the direction of God. And, and so that's really the heart of the house is that we would just be receptive to move when God says move. We stop when God says stop. And so here's the verse, Numbers chapter 9, verse 22. It says, whether the cloud, and so the cloud was, uh, was God's presence, whether the cloud stayed above the tabernacle for two days, a month, or a year, the people of Israel stayed in camp, and they did not move on. But as soon as it lifted, they broke camp and moved on. I got one more verse for you. It's found in Exodus chapter 2, verse 21. And this is going to set the precedence for what we're going to look at today. It says this, then Moses was content. Can you say content? Moses was content to live with the man, and he gave Zipporah, his daughter, to Moses. This morning, I want to talk to you briefly from the subject, Jethro in the bush. Jethro in the bush. Let's pray one more time and we'll jump in. Father, we love you. God, I thank you for this beautiful day that you've allowed us to, to come and to hang out in your presence, Father. I pray that uh, we would not leave here the same way, but we would leave here changed. We would leave here a bit different, God. We want people to notice and say, wow, there's something different about you. There's something different about me, not for my own benefit, God, but so that we can change the world around us. We love you so much. And in Jesus' name, come on, everyone said amen, amen. Hey, I do want to let you know, too, that a quiet church is a dead church. Dead church. And so that simply means if I'm saying something that resonates in your heart, feel free to be like, amen. You can say, preach, preacher. If it's really good, you can be like, mm-mm. I'm back at a brother. You know what I'm saying? If it's really good, feel free. You can get on your feet. You don't even have to say anything. You can just cross your arms and be like, I got it. So we're going to have some fun this morning. Uh, I want to let you know that I just recently enrolled my son into Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. You're a pastor. Violence. Turn the other cheek. I get it. I get it. I get it. My son will turn the other cheek of the person that he punches, right? Like, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but, but we just enroll my son into Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And the whole point, the whole reason why we wanted to do this is because we wanted him to be able to stand up against someone that's his size or bigger. We wanted him to, to not be afraid, if need be, to defend himself against someone his size or bigger. That's the whole goal. That's the whole reason why we wanted to do this. So we enrolled Eli into, um, into Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And uh, they have this thing. It's like a sparring session. And they just get on the mat or get on the mat and they just, they just wrestle, right? Like they just, and it's really funny to see little kids just trying to destroy each other, you know? That's another story. But, but so here they are, they're, they're fighting. Uh, my son is, is fight, fighting on the mat. The only problem is, is they always pair my son up with someone that is like way smaller than him, like knee high, right? Like it's, and I'm like, oh my gosh. And so my son, he, he loves this idea that I'm sparring with someone that is way smaller than me. And so they get on the mat and they begin to spar. And, and my son, he just like lays on the person. Because the guy's so small. And he's looking up at me like. He's so proud of it. He's so proud that, that he's like, he, he's, he's really just laying on the person, but he's winning. And so, so this happens quite a few times where, where he, just, he just paired up with someone that's smaller than he is. And um, one day after jiu-jitsu class, he came up to me and he said, Daddy, did you see that? I said, I did see that. He said, Dad, everyone in the class is so easy. I, I, said, uh, I said, 
understand me for a sec. Like, I, I want to encourage my son, but I also need to let him know something, okay? And so, so I'm like, bud, that's amazing. That's a great job. Like, I, I'm proud of you, but, but here, here's, the, here's the thing, Eli. He said, what, Daddy? He said, or I said, excuse me, I said, buddy, the whole point of why, the whole purpose of why my mom or your mom and I uh, um, signed you up for jujitsu is so that you can defend yourself against people that are bigger than you, not smaller than you. And I said, because I'm trying, I'm trying to like build him up. I'm like, buddy, I believe in you. I believe that you, can, that you can beat up someone that's your size or bigger. And I said, maybe we should move you to the next class. And he said, no. <laughs> he said, I want to stay right here. Because I'm winning, Dad. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm winning. And what I wanted him to understand in this moment was that he was celebrating a success of a level that was below the potential in the purpose that his mom and I had set for him. All because he chose to believe how he saw himself rather than how mom and dad knew how he thinks and how he is. Are you with me so far? He was celebrating a level of success that was below the potential and purpose that we had set up for him. I began thinking about that. I began thinking about this idea of celebrating success. And I began to wonder how many of us this morning were celebrating a level of success that is way below the potential and the purpose that God created us for. I wonder how many of us this morning were living and we're celebrating this idea that, that we are successful at whatever we're doing, but we're really not even tapping into everything that God has created us for. All because we've choose to embrace a narrative or an identity that is different than what God has for us. See, this morning we're, we're talking about purpose. But what I've discovered and what I'm learning more and more is that before you can ever pursue your purpose, you got to first Embrace the correct identity. See, because your identity dictates your purpose. Your identity, how you see yourself, can determine the greatness of what you pursue. And so if you have the wrong identity, you'll be fine living at a level that is below all that God has for you you to do and what he's created you to do. And so while I want you to understand that you're, you're here, no matter who you are, that God created you with a purpose, I need you to understand that. But before that, you got to understand the identity and embrace the correct identity of who God has created you to be. Amen. See, an incorrect, an incorrect perspective, an incorrect identity of who you are can limit the ability of what you think you can do. And so if you think small, and if you think through the lens of how your identity has shaped you through different things that we're jump into, then you're always going to be hesitant because whatever God's called you to, it's not small. You do not have a small part to play in the kingdom of God. But as long as you have the wrong identity, as long as you embrace the wrong narrative, You'll always stop short. The capacity of what you have will be blocked. And so there are things in our life that shape our identity. Isn't that true? So in your notes this morning, I, I, I wrote three things that, that I believe shape our identity. Here, here's the first one. Society. Society. Society shapes your identity, did you know that? Society tells you, 
how to think, how to act, what to do, what to say, what to wear. And if we're not careful, society, culture begins to shape us and, and, and begins to, to mold us. And pretty soon we begin to embrace the identity that society has, has spoken over us. Here's the other thing. So there's society. The, the second thing is our uh, situations. Number two is situations. So some of you in here, you, you've had a lot of not great things happen in your life. Neglect and abuse, hardships. And if we're not careful, those situations can begin to shape our identity, shape the way that we think, shape the way that we act. And the third thing, so we have society, we have situations, and then we have self. See, it tends to go where the situations in, the, in society, we begin to believe those things. And we begin to, to tell ourself who we are. We begin to tell ourselves, this is who I am. This is, what I, this is what I want. This is what I do. This is how I want to speak. This is how I want to talk. This is how I want to act. And we begin to believe. And then soon that becomes our identity. And the problem with allowing, or the problem, excuse me, with embracing society and situation and self, is the problem with embracing that as our narrative, as our identity, again, is because if we're to reach everything that God has created for you, there's flaws in each one of those three things. There's flaws when you begin to embrace the identity of culture. There's flaws that begin to, uh, that, that happen when, when you begin to embrace situations. There's flaws that happen when you begin to believe yourself. And, and, and so, if, if that's not the identity that we are trying to embrace and trying to engage, then there has to be something better, right? And so what I want us to do is, is we're going to look at what I believe the identity that you and I are supposed to embrace or that God wants us to embrace so that we can step into what God's called us to do. And we're going to see that uh, through, the, through the lens of a guy named Moses, And we just read that at the very beginning, Exodus chapter 2. And I want to set the stage of what's happening right here. Moses, uh, he just got in trouble. What we're going to see is that those three things, the society, situation, and self, how, they, how he embraces that as I, his identity and how he sells himself short in his purpose, okay? And, and so, so uh, Moses, he had a horrible situation that just happened. Moses, he, he, he actually just killed somebody, okay? I know what you're thinking. Oh, my gosh. He just, he just killed somebody, and uh, he got caught. Someone was like, hey, aren't you that guy that killed that? And he's like, and he ran. <laughs> like he, he left Egypt, and he ran. He's a fugitive, okay? And so, uh, so his situation, right, draws him to where he, he comes to this well. And at this well, there's seven women there. They're all sisters, okay? And, and, and they're try, these, these seven ladies are trying to get water for their flock. And so they're, they're getting water. And then all of a sudden, these shepherds, they see the women at the well, and they get mad. They're like, what are you doing? And they try to scare these women away from the well. Oh, uh, no, no. Oh, uh, there it is. And, and so, so they try to, uh, to scare these women from the well. And then all of a sudden, da, 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 Moses sees and he comes to the well. And the Bible says that he defends these women. He defends these ladies. And, he, and he's like, hey, I don't know what he said exactly, but whatever the case is, the shepherds, they left. And the ladies, just, they got the water. But oh, watch this. This is, this is society right here. Because now they begin to look at Moses as their hero. 
In fact, as you read in Exodus chapter 2, they begin praising Moses. They begin to be like, oh, Moses, you saved us. Ah, ah." Right? I don't know. Or they could have been like, Moses, you saved us. Whatever. Choose your adventure. Right? Like, some of you looked at me like, ugh, so sexist. Right? Like, just chill. Okay? However you want to think that happened, that's whatever. And so, so here, here's Moses. He's getting the praise of these women. Society begin to draw him closer to a purpose that wasn't what God had for him. And so all of a sudden now, he, he had a situation that happened. He had a, a group a uh, society that began to praise him, and that led him to this guy named Jethro. Jethro was the father of these seven women. And they said, Daddy, this guy saved our life. And Jethro was like, thank you. He said, you can marry one of my daughters. Hallelujah. And so, so, <laughs> so, so Moses, he married one of the daughters, And in verse 10 of chapter 2 of what we read at the very beginning, Moses became content with where he was. Self. He began to think, wow, this this isn't that bad. I got a wife. I got a kid. I got a job, I got a house, this is cool. And what we see is that a situation, society, and self led him to a man-made purpose. And all of a sudden, Moses became a shepherd. Here's the problem. If you put a period at the end of that, it seems fine, right? And Moses was a shepherd, period. End of story. That would be okay if you didn't know the ending because there's nothing wrong. Like most of us, we would love to have a spouse and a job and a kid. And like we, like that, we would love that. But here's what I want you to understand is that there shouldn't be, if you see it, there there should not be a period after shepherd because God did not create Moses to be a shepherd. He called Moses, he created Moses to liberate his people from Egypt. But as long as Moses' identity was found in the situation, in his society, in his self, he was fine being a shepherd. I wonder this morning how many of us were fine being a shepherd because we've embraced society, self, and situations. But I love God because he don't give up on us. I'm so glad that he didn't give up on me when he could have. And so one day, while Moses was shepherding his flock, one day when Moses was fulfilling the purpose that man had given him, he had an encounter with God. And in that counter of encounter with God, it was this burning bush. And in the burning bush, the voice of God began to tell him, Moses, Moses, Moses is like, what? Moses. And then I love this. The next chapter, God begins to tell Moses who he is. See, there has to be a shift. Because you're going to have an identity. It just depends who ident- whose identity you're going to embrace. And so Moses, or excuse me, God, he begins to redefine or remind Moses of his identity. He says, Moses, I am the God of your father, Abraham. I am the God of Jacob and of Isaac. These are patriarchs in, in, the, in, in, in Israel. These are big guys. And basically what God is saying, he's like, there's a legacy in you, Moses. 
There's something inside of you that I've created and I've placed in you for greatness. He's reminding Moses, Moses, I've called you to something bigger than shepherding. There is nothing wrong with shepherding. But God called him to something greater. And as soon as Moses embraced the identity that God gave him, guess what? Then God revealed to him his purpose. The moment God revealed his identity, God then said, this is what I've called you to do. My people who have been oppressed by Egypt, I've called you to free them. That's a, that's a way bigger thing than, than shepherding. Remember, shepherding's not bad, but, but God's called them to free people. Listen, there's a calling over your life. There's a purpose over your life that in some way, somehow, some shape, some form is called to free people from what they're going through. That's called to free people from addictions. That's called to free people from hopelessness. But until we embrace the identity of Christ, of what, of who God has, 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 has uh, formed us and created us to be, we will always live as a shepherd. And we'll never embrace the purpose that he has for us. Do you know how we change the world? We embrace the correct identity. We embrace the identity that God molded and shaped us to be and to do. And so this morning, what I want us to do in our last moments together is I want to give you, so, so let me back up. So we have those three S's that identify or that, that shape our identity. But then we have this thing called the identity of Christ. And, and, and the moment that you surrender your life to Jesus, if you grew up in church, it's called born again. Uh, the moment you accept Jesus as your Lord, we step into a new identity in Christ. And so this is the identity that, that I believe and, and that, that I see all throughout the New Testament that we're called to live in and we're called to embrace. And so I, wa I want to give you four things that I think are part of the identity of Christ. So when you step into and when you embrace the narrative of Christ Jesus, when you embrace the identity of Christ, these are the four things that I believe you have access to. And so here's the first one if you're taking notes. When you embrace the identity in Christ, you are loved unconditionally. You are loved unconditionally. Here's what I want you to know about unconditional love. The way that God loves you, it should draw you closer to him, not further from him. When I understand that everything that I've ever done in my past, how it could defile me and keep me away from a God that created the heavens and the earth, and yet he still loves me? Man, that should bring me closer. That should get me to that place where I'm like, God, here's my life. See, I think a lot of us, we, 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 we've been raised with this notion that, that God is, he, he wants you to change, then come to him but he's the one that changes you when you come to him. I love the verse that's in your notes where, where in Romans 5 that God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still jacked up. While I was still hooking up. While I was still high. What, come on. While I was still... He died for me in my worst state. He died for me when no one else should have. He died for me when, y'all are so quiet. He died for me when I, when no, when everyone else left me. He loved me unconditionally and he died for me in that worst state. 
Come on, I can embrace the image of Christ because I understand that he loves me unconditionally. Here's number two. The identity in Christ. I embrace the identity in Christ. When I embrace the identity in Christ, I understand that I'm adopted into royalty. I'm adopted into royalty. Your value is not who you are, but in whose you are. Your value is not who you are. Takes the pressure off of me. Takes the pressure off of you. My value is not in who I am, but in whose I am. Listen, you got to understand, you got value inside of you. John, I don't see it. I don't feel it. John, I feel like, I feel like there's no value inside of me. You got value. Yes. You're not alone. The verses that we read and uh, that we have in your notes, Ephesians and 1 Peter, uh, Ephesians says that you were adopted into his family. The moment that you put on the identity of Christ, you're adopted into a family. And so you may have been all by yourself. You may have gone through hell growing up, but you are no longer by yourself when you put on the identity of Christ. I love 1 Peter when, it's, when, when he writes that... that um, that we are a chosen people, royal priests. We are part of royalty, y'all. We are part, not because of what you did. You didn't do anything. You didn't do anything. It's not, it's not about what you've done. Your value is not found in you. Men, your value is not found in you providing for your family or not providing for your family. Your value is not found in the manlyhood and the macho-ness that culture tries to tell you that you need to hold on to. Your value is in Christ Jesus. And so when you step into that identity of who Christ made you to be, come on, women, your value is not in how you look. Men too. Your value is not in how you look. It's in what Christ has done for you. And so we're looking at embracing the identity in Christ. First one, I know that I'm loved unconditionally. Second one is uh, I've been adopted into royalty. Here's, here's a third thing. When we embrace the identity in Christ, we understand that I'm strengthened in my weakness. I love this. Let's read that verse in 2 Corinthians. I love the swagger of the apostle. He says, each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. And I love this next part. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness. See, most of us, we don't boast in our weakness. Most of us, we hide our weakness. Most of us, we suppress our weakness. But, but Paul is like, no, I boast in it. Well, Paul, why do you boast in your weakness? Because it's in my weakness, God's strength is perfected. And so he understands that every time I feel weak, it's okay. Every time I feel like I need to give up, it's okay. Every time it feels like I'm roadkill, it's okay. Because I will boast in my weakness. And in my weakness, his strength is perfected. strengthen I'm strengthened in my weakness here's the last one number four I'm shaped by his goodness I'm shaped by his goodness see here's what we have to understand about his unconditional love for you, his unconditional love for me. 
it does not nullify the fact that there are still things in my heart, there are still things in my mind that need to be removed. So he loves you unconditionally, but it should draw you to examine your heart and your mind so that you can identify those things and ask God to remove them from your life. That's his unconditional love. His unconditional love. He, I love this verse. Colossians 3.10. It's in your notes. Put on your new nature and be renewed. Watch this. As you learn to know your creator and become like him. His unconditional love. It draws you closer. It identifies things in our heart and in our life. And and. Our proximity to God should cause us to reflect what we're seeing from Him. Come on, the identity. Listen, the beauty of this is that when I embrace the identity of who Christ is in my life, I could then live I can live with the assurance that whatever he's called me to do, I can do it. Because I know that I'm not alone. When society tells you, you don't belong. No, no, I do. You don't understand. See, I'm part, I've been adopted into this family. When when society begins to tell you, uh, you don't, you don't deserve God's love. No, no, you don't understand. He loves me unconditionally. And his unconditional love is drawing me to change and transform my life. When culture tries to tell you, society tries to tell you, hey, you are so unlovable. Your husband walked out on you. Your daddy walked out on you. Your mama walked out on you. Your wife walked out on you. Your kids don't even love you. Your boss hates you. You can say, no, no, no. You don't understand. God loves me. When we embrace the identity of Christ and we allow him to shape who we are, there's no holding you back. When you understand who God has created you to be, the identity in Christ, there is no holding you back from what what God has created and purposed you to do. Jethro, you can't hold me back anymore because there's a bush, a burning bush calling my name. This morning, I want to leave you with this. There is a burning bush calling your name. There's a burning bush calling your name, wanting to reveal your identity so that you can step into the purpose. Not at the level below the potential that you have, but at a level that will blow your mind. And so again, this identity, it's revealed the moment that we make a decision to follow Christ.